right. Hi, everybody. It's RCFB Talk 134. It's Tuesday night. It's when we talk to you here on Twitter Spaces. My name's Bomek. Hi, Ari. Happy to talk to you about whatever things you'd like to discuss in college football. If you'd like to join a conversation with us, all you have to do is, well, first of all, let's see if this will let me paste that. All right, there we go. If you'd like to join in, just hit the request button from the Twitter app, and we will get to you. I can see I'm starting to load things up. But, yeah, it's off-season. If you'd like to talk to us about anything going on in college football, there's a lot of topics that are on right now. I mean, the one I'm looking forward to starting off with is the Big Ten. Sounds like they've got a new commissioner coming in. The big news there is that the latest commissioner appears to be TV exec from Major League Baseball, Tom Petiti. That is something that should be interesting. This is going to be the second time the uh, conference has gone outside of the traditional college sports realm to find a commissioner. Obviously, outgoing commissioner Kevin Warren was from the Minnesota Vikings. So football, but obviously pro football, and something he decided to return to because, of course, he's leaving to become the next president of the, uh, the Chicago Bears. And this should be interesting to see how Tom Petiti does. There's quite a bit of writing going on there. Again, if this is something you want to talk about or any other topic in college football, just hit request. ESPN got that story first, but some of the analysis has been interesting because the Big Ten hiring, I mean, this is Stuart Mandel. He points out that the Big Ten hiring a former TV exec that is theoretically the TV stuff behind them for the next seven years because they have their TV agreement all set in place. It's going to be done by 2030. It looks like we have someone who wants to join us. I'm going to go ahead and let you up here now. But it should be interesting to see how he does. I agree with some of the analysis that's been out there. The the key things that he's going to have to do, the thing I saw from Nicole Auerbach, is trying to make sure UCLA and USC transition in well, as well as potentially continue to grow the conference. One of the things that struck me, um, kind of looking at some of the rumors that are going out there in the Twitter sphere, Jim Williams, who is fairly reliable on sourcing because he has some involvement in the television broadcast industry. He says Kevin Warren, apparently, when he was working on expanding the Big Ten, he had a vision of creating a, a true mega league, something along the lines of a 2014 league with Cal, Oregon, Stanford, Utah, Washington, and potentially some of the teams from the ACC on his list. According to that rumor, there was pushback from the university presidents in the Big Ten in growing that big that fast. Who knows what the veracity of that is, but that was definitely one of those articles that that got my attention, especially in light of hearing what's going on now with, of course, Warren leaving and the next commissioner being Tom Petiti. But before we go on, again, if you'd like to join us, we'd love to hear from you. looks like we have Quinn Sean Hisham. (laughs) Can't wait for football season, man. Why don't you unmute? I'd love to hear from you. And just a quick heads up, I'm going to kind of hang on before I let people up, just because last week there was a small hiccup where someone waiting for a long time, when they unmuted, everyone could hear them but me. So if that happens again, give me a heads up, and you're welcome to stay up here once you're up on the stage. But what's up? Uh, Can't wait for football season. Why don't you unmute? Love to hear from you. I have a question about, like, the new Big 12 teams. Who do you think suited best for just football? Who do you think will transition best? Oh, into the Big 12. Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And... Gosh, there's so there, the teams that are heading into it are exciting teams, and all of them seem to be doing well. I think I'm most curious to see BYU. That's just maybe my own personal bias there, just because uh, they have that national fan base. They have a lot of uh, upside to them. Cincinnati, we'll see. I mean, they've got Scott Satterfield there. He's, you know, we'll see how they do. Houston should be a good fit. I mean, with Dana Holgerson, I, 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 there's not really a weak one there. And, I mean, UCF, I'm – I'm not entirely sold on Gus Malzahn right now, but we'll see how that goes. So I'm most interested in seeing BYU and how they do. But I, it's going to be interesting, especially seeing with, of course, Oklahoma and Texas still there for that final season. So we've got the uh, the, the extra big 12, um, at least presumably until they finish rating the uh, – <laughs> if they end up rating the Pac-12 once all of that TV rights deal comes down the pipe. I'd love to let someone else as well. Let's see here. Nick Kremer, I'm going to let you up as well, and then I promise to get to to you, uh, Di- Dionysius Miller. But, Nick, what's going on, man? Oh, boy, am I getting that audio issue again? Okay, I didn't. I don't think that quite worked, so no problem. That sometimes happens. Maybe he'll let himself back up. Sometimes we get that issue. So I'm going to go ahead and let you up. 
Dionysius Miller. Sorry about that. Sometimes it's kind of a funny thing with Twitter app. There was an error that sometimes run around where I can't hear speakers, but they can. everyone else can. But let's see here. Dionysius Miller, what's going on? Yeah, I was uh, just going to ask about, uh, do you think that Nebraska is actually going to be able to come back from its ruin? Oh, I think ruin's a bit strong. I mean, definitely. I mean, I'm not saying it's been great. It's definitely been a, a heck of a ride with a, a series of, I mean, I don't know. Is it the curse, curse of Bo Pelini? I, I don't know. But uh, certainly things um, have, have been better there. But that said, I mean, one of the things that struck me, and you see the reports coming out of the spring, and those are things that you always take with a grain of salt. But, you know, hey, look how they're, they're playing, you know, um, they're playing with tackles now. Everything's really aggressive. You know, everything looks really strong. Rule seems to have them in a good position. and will, Their recruiting has been good. I know one of the things that struck me was their NIL numbers apparently were putting them in the top ten. So that's a good sign. I mean, I'm not saying, I mean, I know NIL is a, is a like or hate, mostly kind of discomforting thing for some fans, but at least says you're competing with some major programs, and that puts you among the blue bloods that historically Nebraska has been. So I think Matt Rule could be the guy to, to bring them over. Obviously, we're going to see, and we've done that a couple of times in the past, to some disappointment, certainly, uh, for a lot of Nebraska fans. But the sheer strength, of that program and, and what it can draw in. I think it has that potential because people are certainly willing to throw money uh, at the program because they love it in that state. They have the backing. They have that that blue blood backing, and, and it can turn that corner. Now, the beginning of this season is going to be interesting. I'm really looking forward that they're playing at Minnesota to open it up. That's going to be fun. I mean, the chair rivalry and all of that stuff. And then at Colorado, another old rivalry being renewed. Um those two games are definitely going to be benchmark moments for us because Minnesota is what it is. You know, I'm not going to say they're going to win the Big Ten or anything, but they've, they've certainly, P.J. Flex got them into a competitive program, which I think a lot of Gopher fans are happy with. But Nebraska wants to be more than that. So it'll be interesting. To see. Oh, yeah. I mean, P.J. Flex, probably one of the greater coaches of our time, which I think is overlooked. He it, with what he did. Yeah, and I think we really what happened there, Minnesota, just the luck of their timing. I mean, they had a terrible situation where Tracy Clays got fired after the season ended. And, of course, P.J. Fleck didn't want to interview anybody until he finished, um, it was the Cotton Bowl, whatever, the, the New Year's Six Bowl he was in with Western Michigan. So that made him miss most of the, the coaching cycle. So then Minnesota ends up being the team that is suddenly coachless and he's willing to jump on that. So yeah, Minnesota really, that's how Minnesota ended up with a coach that I think surprised a lot of, of people when they got him. And, and so far it's been good for them because certainly, yeah, I agree. They've, they've been for, performing well, but it'll be interesting to benchmark them. I think the Colorado game will be the more interesting one because there's going to be so much hype for that. Not just because I mean, again, for fans who aren't familiar, those are that's like I noted. I mean, the one time I had a chance, and I recommend anyone see a game in Lincoln if you can. The one team you could tell there was serious dislike for that fan base were, were the effigies of Colorado, which wasn't even playing that day. But um, yeah, that'll be interesting. But also just to see how the two new head coaches <laughs> you've got Matt Rule at Nebraska, you've got Deion Sanders at Colorado. I, I am looking forward to that game because that, that's going to be a fun one to compare on so many levels, and I think that'll be an opportunity. But, you know, it'll be early season, so who knows? We'll have to see how they do in the long run. Will they be able to do what's expected of them against Northern Illinois, Louisiana Tech, and then how they do against the, the mix of things in the Big Ten? I mean, no one's expecting them to necessarily challenge and, and beat Michigan, although you never know. Uh, but certainly I'd be also curious to see how they do at Illinois to see, again, you know, you got Brett there. So I, I think Brett Bielema, he's, he's, I mean, Ill we've had Illinois fans come on here and think what's going to happen in Illinois. When does Illinois get the respect it deserves? Nebraska has it built in to an extent, even though they've been struggling for so long. So I'd be curious to see how all of that works out as the season goes on. But I think it is possible, especially with that hire, and God, I feel saying that really does feel like a throwback to a couple of other past coaches. But I think Nebraska has that opportunity if Matt Rule can get it together. To me, the, the best sign, though, was the fact that their NILs were apparently in the top 10. 
if you can do that, that proves that you have that level of support and you have that level to, to, to maintain it because that's the other problem too. You can be good, but maintaining it on a level that will compete with, you know, if you plan to climb into the very top, you got to be at that level and they have things that, that put them at that level. They just need the, someone to lead them there. Yeah, it's usually not a good sign whenever uh, we think that Nebraska has had a good hire. Yeah, but eventually it will, you know, I mean, <laughs> well, yeah, you can't keep failing, right? Ha 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 ha. No, but um, we'll see where. Yeah. Oh, and mm-hmm. one last yeah. thing. Uh, what are your expectations for what might be the strongest South Carolina team that we've seen? Boy, I South Carolina, we have a, a somewhat of a soft spot for South Carolina and our CFB, mostly because um, Shane Beamer was the first head coach to ever join us here um, for a Twitter space guest during the season. But all of that said, I, there, you, I would like to see improvement. I mean, certainly each season has been impressive. I mean, going eight wins last season. I mean, yeah, they lost to Notre Dame in the Gator Bowl. That 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 was a bit of a down uh, way to end it. But certainly the way they they perform, they keep improving under Beamer. I mean, you know, that first season was just such a such a pleasant surprise for I think South Carolina fans going seven and six, and then you know they they were able to get at least one more win out of it this season. I think next season. I think it would also depend how the wins and losses kind of break down there. But I think if they could, if they can match eight wins again, I think a lot of South Carolina fans will be happy. I mean, I think they would like to see more, but as long as, as Beamer keeps building, uh, you know, a, a winning uh, environment in at South Carolina and kind of developing that out, I think there will be a lot of, there will be, I mean, certainly I, I'm looking forward to the the Duke's Mayo Classic because they got North Carolina again. Those two are always fun to see against each other. I'm not saying they need to beat Georgia, but if they can put a little bit of scare in Georgia, that would be a pleasant thing to see. And then just how they do against those other strong teams. I think at this point, there's some expectations that they have the ability to beat the middle, the other mid teams in the in the conference. It's just going to be seeing how they do on those challenges, like at Tennessee, always, you know. Um, how they'll do against their rival with Clemson at the end of the season. But a lot of those other games seem winnable right now. It's really that Georgia and, and at Tennessee at Georgia and at Tennessee that look the most challenging. That's not to, that's not to insult the other teams. There's certainly some strong ones on there in Florida and Texas A&M and Mizzou. All those could get it together and Kentucky's not a weak team, but I, I think South Carolina, I'm optimistic about it. I'm looking forward to seeing how they do. And, and it's been a great thing to watch them kind of grow, especially after, they have such a – I mean, they are they are the SEC's version – I mean, I'm not saying in history, but the SEC's version of passion that you get like the Nebraska fans where they'll support a team through thick and thin. I mean, South Carolina is – those of us who've known them for so long know their history of filling that stadium, even when they were absolutely horrendous um, over the years. Yeah. All right. Thanks for letting me on, and uh, always remember, you're welcome on the pod poll. Absolutely, man. Thanks so much. And – if you'd like to join us, just feel free to hit request. We'd love to hear from you. Um, I've been kind of holding off on letting people up immediately until sometimes we found when people are on hold for a long time, when they unmute, Twitter screws up and I can't hear them, but everyone else can. So if you do hit request, I promise I will get to you um, as long as we don't run out of time. But um, yeah, so before we go through, I mean, again, if you hit request, I'll let you up. But I just want to kind of go through some of the headlines we've been talking about here. Uh, one of the things that kind of struck us again, the Big Ten has announced that they're hiring their next commissioner. It's going to be, or at least it's it's expected to hire the next commissioner, Tom Petiti, uh, former Major League Baseball and CBS Sports executive, as their next commissioner. That is something that will be interesting. Obviously, the, the the notes that have been made is the Big Ten has a TV deal that's going into 2030, so TV rights isn't a big concern for the conference at this moment. But certainly integrating USC and UCLA is going to be important as well as keeping that conference as strong as possible as things are still moving. And as we watch whether or not the Big 12 and the Pac-12, how they do the ACC and, you know, the SEC SEC could do something. You never know. Um, Certainly Florida State would like them, too, it seems like. But um, one of those other aspects to it is, and again, I mentioned this before I move on. The one of the interesting rumors that came out, and it was from a somewhat credible person, uh, Jim Williams, um, had tweeted. He's a director, producer of live sporting events, as well as a consultant on some of these media deals. He said Kevin Warren, the outgoing Big Ten commissioner, had a master plan to create originally a 2014 league, 
by poaching even more teams from the Pac-12, like Cal, Oregon, Stanford, Washington, maybe Utah, as well as the ACC. Um, and there was pushback coming from the other presidents of the Big Twelve, Big Ten. Pardon me. That's that's believable. I don't know how much to put into it. Certainly, I think he wanted to move back to the NFL. There were some great articles last summer talking about how when Warren got to the Big Ten, he was just kind of horrified to find how, I don't want to say amateur, but how things hadn't changed because they'd had such a long period of time under one commissioner. Things were still run like they were in the late 80s. Things were a little less polished. Coming from being the chief operating officer of the Minnesota Vikings, everything in the NFL is polished. If you've ever dealt with the NFL, it's striking. I remember talking to, actually, we previously had the guest, the general manager, which is more than just being a general manager of the SoFi Stadium, uh, where, of course, they have the college football national championship as well as they've had the uh, L.A. Bowl a couple of years. And he said, just dealing with the Super Bowl, everything gets the volume turned down. Um, on behalf of our CFB, I was a person in L.A. this past January covering that game, and you talked to everybody on the ground, and they said this – College football environment is so easy compared to the NFL. So I think that's what attracted Warren. So he headed back, and now he's going to, of course, be the next president and CEO of the Bears. Moving on, you know, the other big story on RCFP was hearing that Cliff Kingsbury is expected. Well, in fact, pardon me, tonight, or at least today, pardon me, they made it official where Cliff Kingsbury is joining USC staff again. Some of you may remember for like right after Texas Tech fired him for about a month, he was hired by Clay Helton as sort of a, a hopeful savior of his uh, tenure as USC's head coach by hiring Cliff Kinsbury to be his offensive coordinator. Then, somewhat surprising to me anyways, and I think some other people, the Arizona Cardinals hired him away to be their head coach. And I don't think anyone would blame any, anybody for taking an NFL head coaching gig and that massive paycheck compared to even being a well-paid uh, pardon me, offensive coordinator in college football. So he's going to be joining USC. He's not going to be necessarily the offensive coordinator, but he's going to be part of the coaching staff and certainly helping with the team's quarterbacks. Certainly that is a – he's going to be senior offensive analyst. That's the official title. Um, that'll be a big plus for USC. Obviously, they've got some talented quarterbacks at the school, <laughs> including the racing, reigning Heisman champ. So we'll see – where that goes from there you know there was an interesting article i was reading and kind of a discussion on whether or not and i believe this was a, this was a q a but whether or not there should be a limit on the number of assistants that college football programs can bring in because right now you've got obviously we all know um the nick saban school for uh coaches who need to who don't coach well and need to coach better but there's plenty of that and it seems to be obviously the blue bloods will have that ability to keep piling on analysts after analysts and you know load those staffs should there be a limit on it the counter to that would certainly be that they would be challenged in court and that the way things are going with the ncaa in courts and just the general freedom to, to hire it would probably be broken, so I don't think you could limit it. And certainly, I think a lot of these programs are just willing to spend what they can spend on padding out their uh, their um, their analysts and their other non coordinator, non position coach coaching positions. So that that was definitely an interesting conversation I've seen pop up with the Cliff Kingsbury question. Again, if you want to talk about anything in college football, feel free to hit request. I'm happy to kind of keep going on here until we. Um, until we, uh, until anyone wants to speak, or until we run out of thirty minutes. But um, you know, the other, another interesting thing here, and this is kind of building on a story in the NIL world, um, sort of almost a re uh, sort of a uh, epilogue to all of it is Florida. Obviously, we all know the Jaden Rashada mess. For those who need a quick reminder, he was promised what essentially sounds like now the number seems to have kind of frozen at about thirteen eight wasn't $13.8 million all at once. It was like a four-year deal that could mature out to that number of dollar amounts. And, of course, it fell through. Whoever was going to pay any amount of that simply did not. So the first check, which I believe was I've seen reported as half a million dollars, never arrived. And he did not show up on campus for Florida. In fact, he had, when that was signed, flipped from Miami to the University of Florida. Now he's at Arizona State. He seems to be fine there. We'll set that aside. But going back to Florida, one of the news stories that came out that I thought was particularly interesting is they now have decided to put all of their collectives into one and kind of manage it a little, little bit differently. Now, we've seen things like this 
at other programs where, you know, again, we're still kind of in the Wild West and maybe we're starting to see things coalesce in this area. But so many different universities had various groups, various, you know, and I'm saying people who care about the programs. These aren't people that, you know, they're not trying to be chaotic. But the problem is a lot of people with this kind of money who can donate and, and want to help their school. They all want to be the lead dog. So you had a lot of folks starting these collectives. And sometimes, you know, we've seen co them coalesce at many universities. And this is going to be Florida's turn for that. I believe they're calling it Florida Victory. And it's going to be the, the more of a centralized um, NIL collective for the Gators so they don't run into a, a situation like the, uh, like the Rashada mess. And I think that's something that we'll see more at different programs. We are still in a bit of a Wild West. We'll see where things go. You know, speaking of which, one of the other topics that came up last week, at least on our CFB, was a discussion of what Oklahoma is passing. Because a lot of states, as soon as the NIL law started to come out and California took the lead on that and basically forced the issue, some states took what now in retrospect were very restrictive rules. And as things started to progress, as they saw, especially, I want to say some of the more, con the more some of the more dominant college football programs saw that other universities could do things they couldn't do because of these restrictive state laws. We've started to see a lot of those laws get changed. We've seen that happen in the state of Alabama. We've seen that happen in the state of Florida. Now, Oklahoma has. But what made Oklahoma's notable, they added a clause that basically says the NCAA can't enforce anything in the state of Oklahoma against their FBS programs. Of course, those are Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, and Tulsa. Um, each three of those are competing at different levels in the money game, certainly. Although, one of my favorite comments on RCFB is it would be fun to imagine if the late T. Boone Pickens was still around, what he would be offering as an incentive to Oklahoma State players. Um, my favorite, again, my favorite variation on that, someone suggested that they should give um, players their own oil well or just a piece of land and make it like a loot box, you know, like in video games where you don't know if your land is actually going to have significant mineral rights underneath it or if it's just going to be a, a random patch of, of Oklahoma Prairie. But I think that would be kind of a fun <laughs> – that one made me laugh. But certainly it'll be interesting to see whether or not that's enforceable or not. I don't think the NCAA is in any mood to start a lawsuit with anyone in the state of Oklahoma over that kind of a rule. But one thing these different laws coming from state to state could provoke is potentially a, uh, a, a desire for federal legislation. There's, there's pluses and minuses to it. Obviously, I understand a lot of folks would not like the federal government involved in anything, let alone trying to regulate college football. But one thing that could pop in mind is if all the states are making different laws on NIL and it starts to get too chaotic, yeah, there's a couple of there's enough uh, major universities out there that could start to push their uh, Congress people to potentially start pushing in that direction. So we'll see. That would make it more universal. That would make the rules a little more on one page. But I don't know if we'd end up in that direction. But it's just one thing to consider, one thing to think about as we move forward and as things, again, try to kind of move into some more some kind of coalesce into some more for uh, some more formal rules and some more people are getting used to the NIL as we we are now in year two after talking about how the Florida one uh, Florida collectives are all merging into one um you know one of the other stories that came out to, uh, in this week that also struck me because classic thing we're all trying to I mean the ongoing story is what's going on with the Pac-12 we're still not sure where they are their TV rights keep getting delayed or at least some of their presidents are not on the same page. We've had various presidents of the conference say we're imminent to have a media deal. And then you'll have another president, for example, the University of Utah's uh, president has been one of the ones saying like, no, it's not coming anytime soon. And the word is that it's not going to come until potentially late spring, or early summer. And who knows if it'll keep getting pushed back from there. One of the stories, therefore, that's been coming out. Um, another link, uh, probably another report coming out of the New York Post in their sort of their pan sports newsletter, because they like to cover all the areas of sports business news, is a rumor that if somebody were to jump from the Pac-12 to the Big 12, it might be Colorado. Now, I don't know if that's going to go anywhere. There have been some fun comments on RCFB. Uh, TCU fan board at work noted that, <laughs> I love this idea. Hey, sorry, Big 12, the line at the corner store was 13 years long. But I finally got those cigarettes and milk I went out to pick up. 
So <laughs> the idea of Colorado returning back after all those years would be kind of funny. But again, whether that's there's any strength to that, this is the era. This is the we're in the seemingly never ending silly season of trying to figure out what's going on with the Pac-12 and the Big 12. Again, if there's anything you'd like to say and join in the conversation, we'd love to hear from you as we kind of go into the, the waning minutes of the RCFB talk 134. You know, another interesting comment that came out, John Wilner, who's obviously a Pac-12 writer. He tends to write quite a bit about the conference. I see someone wants to be up. I will let you up right now, Peter. Um, he points out that about 15 football programs subsidize the rest of the P5 as far as looking at the numbers. And, of course, the P5 subsidizes the rest of the FBS, which subsidizes the rest of Division One, which subsidizes the other NCAA divisions. And he says that is one screwed up business model. Now, one thing I do seem to say is you those – top 15 or 16 programs, it's nice that they're, they're so wealthy and everything, but I wouldn't ever want to see them peel off. I think some of the fans pointed out that even if the Eagle Dog pointed out, even if the only top 16 programs played each other, somebody's going to shake out to the bottom of those standings. Uh, UCLA fan Jay Brew 92 said, even if you put them on the same conference, people like seeing that, that diversity of teams, that variety, all of those games, and seeing who climbs up from all the d- different corners. You know, I want to let you... Uh, Hear your piece, Peter. What's going on? Thanks for joining us. Yeah, of course, man. Thanks for letting me jump in. It's uh, ironic. I actually lead one of the two uh, collectives at Arizona State, so funny to hear you bring up uh, Mr. Rashada. Oh, but, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I've thanks. enjoyed hearing how he's doing over there because I know he's got that interesting deal with a bike company. Um, yeah. And, and I, okay, I got to just say one quick thing. This is just such a silly thing. I'm Persian, so when I saw his name was Reza Farsi, I've never heard that last name because that's like saying – because Farsi is in the language for those of us who, who came right. from Persian extraction. So it would be, I told somebody, it's like being like Jao Portuguese, you know, like <laughs> trying to come up with a name. I'm sure he's really great. I just love that. I just, as a person, I just thought that was awesome. But um, side of that, yeah, totally right. personal note. Sorry, yeah, anyway. But what's going on, man? What's on your mind? I actually wanted to ask a little bit more about the uh, the Pac-12 rights. Um, I know you mentioned kind of the schedule, but our timeline, what have you been hearing? There's been a ton of reports of like some wild things, right? Like Oxygen Network or the CW or all these different things that seem completely insane. But from what you hear, is there validity to that type of discussion or is it simply timeline to land with a more established sports network? You know, at this point, the one that seems to have the most credence from at least the people reporting on it is the CW, which again, to me, is, is it's crazy to think that. It sounds like the CW had some changeover in, in ownership and the, the new folks want to go into live sports. So suddenly the Pac-12 being willing to talk, you know, because they hadn't before. And, and I get why not when the, with the other folks has, has sort of fit into that. Um, how that goes, I don't know. I mean, we'll see where it moves. I know clearly the desire is to have the Pac-12 have as many games as possible on a linear network. For those listening who may not know, that means, you know, like your normal cable television or network television stations rather than streaming. Um, and then, you know, get as many other games as possible. Because obviously the idea is you want to get your, your, your material out there in front of as many eyeballs as possible. And it sounds like ESPN at the very least has some interest, but only in some games, um, particularly the, the Pac-12 after dark spot, because it is it pr- brings in eyeballs, certainly on the West Coast. And, and those of us, uh, you know, those of us uh, uh, true sickos in the central and eastern time zones. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see. One thing I am curious to see, it seems like to some extent there is a bit of uh, uncertainty even among the university presidents. It sounds like they're starting to get a little bit uh, co- coalesced a little bit. I get why Klyovkov isn't really, the, the commissioner isn't being super... Um, uh, conversant about that with the media because a lot of this stuff is sensitive if you have something that might grow, especially with somebody who you might not expect. You'd, uh, you'd want to keep some level of confidentiality. I respect that just because my own profession. I'm an attorney, so I get that. A lot of the big... I mean, heck, USC and UCLA bolting to the Big Ten surprised everybody, uh, you know, which is, is again, right. confidentiality is key. So sometimes even the best news for a particular team or in this case, a conference can come out of, of quietness. But it is it is just it, the, the silence so it has bred all of these rumors, all of these wild rumors, like how many teams are they going to have? Are teams going to leave? Are teams going to join? Um, are they going to add, you know, San Diego State, and S- Southern Methodist? Are they going to, uh, you know, there's so much going on now and people want to fill that void. 
which has led to all of these rumors. So then going back to what you were asking, the CW seems to be the le- one of the leaders right now. But whether that moves forward or not, I think everyone's been slightly burned by hearing other rumors that just didn't pan out. So I would I would put a little right. bit of a, 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 a caution to all of it. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you think so? And then I'll, I'll jump off, let somebody else jump in. But let's say in a scenario where it actually does end up in a place like CW, is that likely looked at as like innovative and different? Or is that like a bad look for the conference? <laughs> well, I, I, it's, it, I could tell you who would pitch it in which direction. Certainly the conference. I, I mean, I think I know my answer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I think it's going to depend on who's talking on that. But certainly I... Gosh, you know, I it depends on who watches. I mean, if people start watching it and the ratings are good. No one's going to argue like, oh, it'll sound like a this was great. This was this was a master stroke. Wow. You got it out of the, the hands of the usual powers and all of that stuff. But ultimately, and I think we always have to remember, it comes down to dollar amounts. So as long as it pleases the members of the conference, then it's probably going to be OK. And I think to an extent. That's how Larry Scott was able to keep so many of the programs, you know, from getting even more disgruntled during the kind of the fiasco of the Pac-12 network where it was really hard to get anywhere. Um, You know, it was almost like classifying some of the Pac-12's games in a place that many people couldn't find it. So really, I think anything, frankly, I think anything that gives them opportunity to, to be seen is good. Um, and then money, they almost go hand in hand. I think the teams are going to care the most about the money, though. If the money isn't there, boy, is thing, are things going to get interesting again um, for conference realignment? Because it seems like it was throwing a lifesaver to an extent when they agreed to expand the playoff. Because suddenly you didn't need to be necessarily in the top two conferences in terms of money and size. Now the Big Ten and SEC, you could be in the other P5 and even in some of the G5 conferences have a shot at making uh, the playoff now. It seems reasonable, but, um, but if the money isn't there, that's still going to anger me- uh, teams and make them open to someone as aggressive as your mark. Because your mark is, I, I was positive about him from what I was reading before he joined, the, when they announced him, before he actually joined the conference. And he's proven to be exactly what he seemed like on paper. I mean, I was listening to interviews with him when he was with the Nets, and I'm like, this guy sounds dynamic. He sounds completely not what I expected, yeah. especially compared to how dry and boring it was before at the big 12. So, you know, it's going to be, I, I, this is going to be an interesting time. I mean, if Klyovkov can make something happen that keeps the teams happy, that'll be considered a major victory for his tenure there. Yeah. It does seem like it's kind of uh, all going to end up riding on this with some of the realignment stuff for him and and how he's viewed within the conference. But um, yeah, no, appreciate you providing that insight and answering those questions. Uh, also, for shouting out Reza and State Bicycle Company, that was an awesome deal. You're happy to be able to help get done with Jaden last week. So yeah, I'm glad for that. Around. You know, I I, I got to say this much. I always say people got to remember these are young men who are just trying to like. Can you, they don't. I mean, I don't. When I was 18, I didn't. I couldn't even imagine dealing with the kinds of numbers and deals these guys are. So I'm just happy that these kids, because it's it's a contact sport. We all know that. We've all had players we've loved that suddenly they're pro days ended because of one bad play on a practice or a season or heaven forbid a pro day so i mean you know get there get that money now good for them i'm happy for him and i hope he i hope he has a good career for the sun devils and and i hope good luck out there appreciate that all right we're gonna have one last comment just because i usually wrap up after about 30 but I, i wanted to let one more person up here uh coach clark we've talked to you before uh recruiting analyst over um at western oregon what's going on Of course, now watch doesn't work. Who knows? <laughs> this has got to hit on mute. Sometimes it doesn't. We've had, I know Nick, he apologized early. He was trying to join and his, uh, con- uh sorry. No, no that. worries, man. How are you doing? Uh, I've been a little bit exhausted. I, uh, I sub part, you know, I, I substitute teach quite a bit, you know, welcome to division two. So I just got done reading green eggs and ham today in a kindergarten for like 12 times. I'm, I'm feeling a bit pooped. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness uh, i feel you anyone who's been uh anyone who's been a parent knows i still have a few memorized from when my kids were toddlers i think it was like uh oh gosh i can't i even get into it but half those board book uh, 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 touching a board book brings back like flashbacks but what's going on man what are I your thoughts these this. days well so we're talking about you know everyone's talking about the pack 12 you know breaking up but i think it might if anything it'll go back to being the pack 10 just 
Um, I predict, you know, you know, what I see with all this NIL stuff, I've always come in from the standpoint, do I think we should be, you know, you know, should these kids be getting ridiculous stuff, you know, if they, if they've earned it, you know, yeah, sure. But if anything, the NIL deals take away all the stupid penalties and the bagels and cream cheese stuff, you know, they're not busting a, a, a kid for getting 250 bucks from his coach because the kid was starving. He didn't have money for groceries or something like that, you know. Um, Absolutely. But, but, you know, it's like not everybody in college football is getting rich off of this. You know, we have a couple guys on our squad that they get stu- some stuff from Barstool, and I don't know a whole lot about that. You know, they're a Barstool athlete, but that's about it. Um, but at least they get that your... chance. You know, I think that's wonderful, especially at oh, the yeah. divisions like D2. I remember, for example, the Popeyes meme kid. He's at, what, Lake Erie out in uh, – out in uh, he's a D2 player out at Lake Erie. And they figured out – somebody realized – and I love the way that even developed out. Like the internet – I think someone on Twitter or Reddit, um, not on RCFB, but just somewhere just found out, hey, anyone remember the Popeyes meme kid? He's now old enough to be a football player. And someone went, wait, he's a Division II football player. He's an actual college football player. And from that, Popeyes got word of it. And, you know, they reached out to him and made a deal happen, which I thought was – that was awesome. And again, you know, those little things that used to not happen, you know, I agree with you. It's good to see them and even have that opportunity for, you know, young men. Yeah. I'm sure, you know, as teams do well in the local community, the more eyeballs on a team, the more team does well – the more you're going to see, I think, potentially even more localized NIL deals, you know, because then there is that encouragement for local businesses to support the program and reach out and, and show that by by sponsoring some of those young men who play for those college football teams at every division. Heck, I, I mean, I've been like, I've been eating enough little teasers. What the heck? Um, I'm joking. But, uh, you know, not one thing I think I've been thinking a lot about it, you know, I checked the portal a couple of days ago and it's supposed to open up here again a bit. I think, you know, time, time heals all wounds and it's going to slow the insanity that is the, and the three ring circus that is the transfer portal down quite a bit, you know, from, from my perspective. And that was some of this NIL stuff that say, you know, you're not going to go walk on and at some, try to walk on at some big school and be a punching bag, you know, because, um, I don't know. I always think of the Veggie Tales song, "Pirates That Don't Do Anything." Coaches, you know, players that'll big time a coach, waiting for that mystery full ride that's, you know, in the land of far, far away that doesn't exist, or they go into the portal without a plan. You know, it's kind of like that. You know, for the pirates that don't do anything. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, Coach Clark, that insane. I, I've got to slowly wrap up, but oh, I wanted sorry, to actually sorry. get your opinion on something because this is something that came up last week. I know you weren't you weren't on, and I just wanted to ask you because you. You coach in the same conference. You're part of a team in the same conference. Um, what do you think of the loss to Simon Fraser? Uh, I feel bad for the community and their alumni. Um, By the way, before you continue, you know, let me it, just it, note it, for those who are not familiar: Simon Fraser, uh, they play. They're the Red Leafs. They're basically in suburban Vancouver. They were the one NCAA team in Canada. They're still playing in all other sports. But with the way things turned out with a couple of programs in the GNAC dropping football, the remaining teams joined the Lone Star Conference, which, as you can guess, is mostly based in Texas. And the Lone Star Conference did not take Simon Fraser as a part of their conference. So Simon Fraser in Vancouver, which already was kind of, I mean, that's a tough situation for a lot of things. They announced that they're closing their, they're shutting down their football team effective immediately. Um, so setting that aside, I apologize. I just realized I wanted to catch everyone up here, but, but yeah, that's been a, that's been a real sad thing to hear. I blame the prime minister. (laughs) Justin Trudeau. (laughs) To be fair. Um, no, it's just that there's some stuff you have to have in order, you know, like during COVID you had to have a vaccine to go through and, uh, you know, with, you have your passport paperwork and all that, you know, I think it might have something to do with that. By the way, I have a quick question. But, did you guys, um, did, did, did the conference have to give every player a passport? Did they did they work something out so that all the players could actually make it up there for, for football games? Yeah, so if you're, if you, you know, so at least passport, birth certificate, any anything that's proof of U.S. residency, um, our, uh, our training staff and people are well-versed on that. I was actually prairie dogging for a bit when I got hired. I, the first thing I did was I went and applied for a new passport and I was worried I, you know, I, I had to, I think I had to do something where I got it 
mailed express because I was prairie dogging whether I get it on time, you know. Luckily, the people at the Roseburg post office were very, very helpful. Um, so what I will say is I feel bad for everyone in that community. I've talked to some of the alumni on, on Twitter and, you know, I mean, I will say, say you know, out of all the, the teams I'd break down film on last year that, you know, that we've played before, I would say that probably Simon Frazier had included the most. And no matter what their record was, no matter um, how talented they were or how much better we were supposed to be on paper, you know, we ne it was never a week off for us, you know. I mean, because they would, you know, they would they would play you hard for four quarters, and um, you know, you, you know, my heart goes out to them losing the program. I'm God forbid it's some kind of domino effect on the West Coast, you know. It seems like it's been almost uh, like a uh, a slow moving domino effect because we lost to Zusa Pacific, you know, uh, some of the other teams. Humboldt State. Yeah, I, Western Washington. Some of my I I had some, you know, and that was a sad thing because I had some some homeboys that. Uh, some te some teammates, some JUCO teammates that played at Humboldt, you know, all, all, like a lot of guys like Dwayne Mayweather, you know, who, you know, who was a coach. He runs O-line masterminds now. He was a coach on my junior college team, played there. You know, a lot of, a lot of my coaches had rubbed elbows there at some point, you know. Uh, I mean, the sad thing is, is, you know, I mean, you know, as, if you look at those schools that have dropped it, I'm not curious. I mean, I'm just – I mean, we're, we've talked about this maybe in, in a few coaching meetings. Like, apparently, after Azusa Pacific dropped football, they lost 4,000 students. And, you know, my uncle actually works maintenance at Humboldt State, and he says they, you know, they've probably lost a couple thousand since they dropped football, you know. Yeah, they had to change that entire school over. I mean, they, they became a Cal Poly, which they weren't before. They went from being a part of the, you know, which it, it kind of sounds odd, but in California, that was kind of a shift. They were basically a typical Cal State campus, and then not long they were suffering as a campus in general. And then, yeah, I think the football team being lost was part of that. And yeah, now they're they're Cal Poly, which pumped a lot more money into them and made them a little bit more attractive, at least rather the state. But yeah, they had to do a complete rebuild of that program. But yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and I apologize, uh, Coach Clark. It's about time to wrap things up. We've got a little. Yeah, more. if any, if there's any Simon Fraser. Frazier alum uh, out out here. I mean, you know, my heart goes out to you guys. You, I mean, I I was actually surprised by it myself. It came out of the blue. I had a buddy of mine. He's now the defensive coordinator at Washington High School. They're in uh, they're you know in in the Seattle Tacoma area, and he sends me you know he sends me hey this kid was a two star player for us quarterback yada yada yada. Um, he was going to go to Simon Frazier before the program folded. And I go what the program folded you know. I mean, we just you don't you don't wish that on wish that on. Anything. Yeah, no, and I know even surprise. Ironically, it surprised the Lone Star Conference, even though the fact that they weren't brought in by the Lone Star kind of signed their uh, death warrant. They, all those Lone Star teams that still had them on the schedule next year now are are uh, scrambling to to fill that schedule. But that's well, that's just how it works. The, the, the sad thing was is I thought Simon Fraser just you know they deserved to stay. They were the most improved team. You know, yeah. like uh, they up. Their their last Lone Star Conference game, they'd upset, you know. They, yeah, West they Texas upset Western and, Texas. And, and yeah, West Texas A&M. Defending, defending, defending Lone Star champs, you know. And it's like I, I I talked about it, you know, sitting down with us coaches, you know, these guys, you know, you, you, you it's not a it's not a check mark or a, a week off for anyone, you know. They're play a hard and they're improving, and I'd hate to be the guy that that takes the week off and then gets you know, you know, gets upset. Definitely. Well, I'm going to go ahead and slowly start wrapping this up. One last thought I want to just say on Simon Fraser: Their final game was the final Shrum Bowl, which was one of the coolest, kookiest things in college football that they had only just brought back after a, uh, I want to say, a dozen-year hiatus. Because there's two college football programs that are uh, soon to be only one in the Vancouver, Canada area. Simon Fraser, which is, was D2 NCAA football, and then University of British Columbia, which plays Canadian rules football in the University League up there. So they restored their rivalry, and the basis of the rivalry was was kind of cute. Depending on who the home team was, those were the rules they would use. So the last game was a home game at Simon Fraser, and so they played NCAA rules. And uh, the UBC Thunderbirds won by a point. So it was a close game. It was a fun game by all accounts. But unfortunately, that ended up being the final game for Simon Fraser. So that ends at the, the one Canadian college football team um, in the NCAA. Anyways, on that note, we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and start wrapping us up here. This was RCFB Talk 134 every Tuesday night. 
we hear from you and just talk about what's going on. Um, if you miss the beginning of this, this turns into a recording as soon as it's done, and then we upload it to wherever you get your podcasts. But love hearing from you. We'll be back next Tuesday night. I hope you all have a great rest of your week and all the things that are going on in college football. Now, I'm going to hang up and listen. <laughs>